Hello and welcome to Memoirs of Successful Women. I'm Annie Gibbons, founder and CEO of Women's Biz Global, and I invite you to kick off your heels, get comfortable, and be ready to receive the golden nuggets that are shared as you listen in to candid conversations I have with fascinating women from around the globe. Business leaders, entrepreneurs, humanitarians, athletes, and a whole lot of regular people. They will keep you riveted as they let their guard down and open up on aspects of their business and life journey, how they measure success and what they have learned along the way. My intent is that our conversations will inspire you to embrace opportunities and possibilities beyond the limits of your imagination because I know that this is where we reclaim our power. I want you to reclaim your power, your strength and vulnerability to stand in your truth and propel yourself towards the life that you dream to live. Hello and welcome to Memoirs of Successful Women. I am super excited to be connecting with you all again this week and I am not going to disappoint because we have an amazing guest today. Her name is Rosie Golby and I actually met Rosie at an airport going to New Zealand uh, with my lovely hubby James and Rosie was just sitting next to us having a cup of tea and of course Annie being Annie, we suddenly started chatting and you are just going to be absolutely dazzled by Rosie. So before I introduce her to you, welcome, Rosie. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so lovely to have you. And um, and Rosie's not Australian. She's not New Zealander. She's actually English. So you'll hear that in her beautiful accent today. And Rosie's going, we're going to be talking all things rugby and women's rugby because Rosie has been in the rugby family for more than 35 years. She, After playing rugby in at university, she became involved in administering the world's game at a national level. A national level. Now it wasn't a world's game at this stage. It was a, it was a just a thing that you did at uni or you did in your own country. And and we are going to be talking about her in, incredible journey of watching a sport, a, a, a sport that became a very strong female sport, go global. So uh, welcome, 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 Rosie. I would love you to tell us, just start off now of why were you going to New Zealand? What was happening in New Zealand? Why were you just so excited when I met you? <laughs> so, it was so exciting, so exciting. I was off to watch the Women's World Cup, um, World Cup 2021 that had been delayed because of COVID. It was in New Zealand. It was the first time a World Cup had been held in the summer, Southern Hemisphere. It was also the first time a World Cup for the women had gone over six weeks. And I was on my way to watch the quarter semis and finals. And I was just so looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness and I, we just picked up your energy you went oh isn't it just so exciting when you're doing something is going to watch something that you love and um, you're just going to have a ball that connects you with all those other people who are in your world right so it gives an opportunity to actually you know go somewhere that everyone you know in the world of women's rugby is going to be there right they're all going to be cheering celebrating uh, wanting um, obviously to win but but just to celebrate the the the, the moment that that, you know, women's rugby is is actually, you know, growing and, and having a, this global presence. So I would love you to take us back then because it wasn't always this way. Uh, you started, uh, tell us your journey then at when you used to play rugby and then you're thinking, wouldn't it be great if female rugby, you know, could actually be a bigger thing? You know, we all watch men's sport. You know, what were your views when you were a young girl playing rugby thinking, you know, where could this go? Was it a dream that it could be one day you get a World Cup or was it that you actually went, you know what, if we all just bandy together, we can make this happen? I don't think we sort of thought of it as a dream. We just wanted to play rugby. So I play, I started playing at university like a lot of women did in the 80s because that's where the, the rugby clubs were. Um, and you played rugby, you played against other universities. And as those women left university, they set up clubs around the country. Um, and I think that was just it. You just want, we just wanted to play rugby. I don't think we had any other thoughts at that point in time. And, and, I, and, I, and what happened was the U Women's Union was formed. 
um, by a group of very inspiring women who decided we needed to do something slightly more formalized about it. And I happened and it was literally I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I was asked to sit on that national committee. I had to go to, for it to be elected. And it was all because um, somebody had asked me to organize a sevens tournament at very short notice. And I said, as you do. Yes, of course I will. We'll have a national sevens tournament at our club, which was Oxford at the time. Um, and I'll organize it in six weeks. Of course. Why not? And um, based on that, I was asked if I'd go to the AGM and I stood um, and I became assistant secretary for what was then the Women's Rugby Football Union, um, which covered England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And I guess it all just went from there. <laughs> they definitely asked the right person, right? You've got to ask the doers. You've got to, you know, everyone knows, um, you know, that we we love all the, you know, the ones who are actually, you know, playing the game, doing all the amazing things, getting the, the sponsorship, the promotions, but we forget that it actually has to be the doers, the administrators, the people who can actually show up at all of those meetings, have agendas, have have plans of, of what we're wanting to achieve, how we're going to do it. And uh, so therefore, you know, I, I love celebrating every element of, of what it actually takes. So, so you must have been pinching yourself back in those days going, oh my goodness, I'm now the secretary of the World you know, Rugby Football Union. Was it a World Football Union then? It was no, just, it like was that. just Great Britain. So it was just Great Britain um, wow. at the time. And did I pinch myself? No, I don't think I did. I just thought that we were trying to facilitate rugby for women across Great Britain. And you just had to go through certain steps to allow us to do that. There was obviously there was an international um, stage and the Great Britain played initially and then the respective home nations played. Um, and we just you just got on and did it. And there was all these women that just volunteered. And did they volunteer? I mean, we had no base. So we used to have committee meetings at different people's houses in England. So one, I don't know, one time you might be in London, then you might be in Yorkshire, then you might be down in Devon. And you just knew that your Saturdays on those committee dates, and I think they were probably every six weeks, you will be spending your whole day driving to somebody's house to sit in a house and take decisions about the game that we thought were the right decisions at the time. And different people stepped forward, but people had different skills. You know, there were some people who were really good at sponsorship. There were some people that wrote the rules, did the coaching. We had women that ran the leagues and their job was, yes, we'll set up a league and we'll organise a league because... That means we have structured rugby. Why wouldn't you? I mean, it, it was literally, why wouldn't you? <laughs> why wouldn't you want to do that? It's just a good idea. I love it. It's no great revolution of this is going to be super amazing. It's kind of like, well, why wouldn't you want to be doing this? We, we just love it. We want to see where it's going and we all need to do our part. So let's just, you know, hunker down and make that happen. And uh, it certainly takes a village. And that's what that's what your story is actually showing, that all these people just show up, uh, you know, week after week, month after month, and they do their bit and they don't and they don't complain and they, you know, uh, they hope that it's helpful, right? Um, so, so on that journey, you then were a significant part of then, you know, helping to build rugby in in um, in Britain. But then, then how did you do that big leap? How does a, how does from where you were positioned that go to a world group? You suddenly then having to have a whole lot of different skills, a whole lot of different relationships, a whole lot of different countries at different stages of their sport with all these people who just meet up and make things happen. It's it's a massive shift to actually have something that is truly global. It is. And I think what happened was that four women decided that they would hold a World Cup in 1991. And they came to our committee and said, we'd like to hold a World Cup in Wales. Um, Richmond had gone on tour to New Zealand and other clubs have been playing, you know, into, com into country. And so we said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's all go ahead, organise World Cup. So these four women organised the 1991 World Cup, um, which wasn't sanctioned by World Rugby at that point in time. There was no funding for it. They they had full-time jobs. Um, one of them had, had a daughter and was on maternity leave. Another one, as the World Cup started, 
she started her maternity leave because her baby had just been born. Um, so they organized this World Cup that was based in Wales. And at the time we thought, well, we've got all these nations together. Um, let's get the representatives together and let's have a first committee. So, so that was what we did. Or it wasn't a committee. It was a meeting about the development of the game and what we should do and where we should go. And it was an introduction, getting the administrators, I guess, to talk to the administrators. Um, and we did invite what was the IRB, which was World Rugby then, and they did come, but they there still wasn't a recognition about the women's game. Um, and in, at, at that meeting, I met um, a couple of women from America and Canada, respectively. Um, and, and it sort of went quiet afterwards and not a lot happened. But then in 1994, um, it was decided that there'd be another World Cup and it was going to be the Netherlands. They'd said they would host it in 91, but for various reasons, they couldn't. So at short notice, Scotland decided or offered their services and said, yep, we'd like to organise the World Cup. So the 1994 World Cup was held in um, in Edinburgh, organised by a committee of women, including Sue Brodie, another amazing Scottish woman who was instrumental in the development of the game in Scotland. And at that meeting, we had another um, World Cup, meeting and, and Jill and Jamie from Canada and America and I spoke beforehand we had a conversation um, and we spoke about some of the things we thought that we should do and where the game should go um, and we again invited World Rugby to attend um, Keith Rowlands attended uh, who was running the game um, in, in, in Wales based in Wales but around the world and you have to remember the men's game was only just coming on board I guess from a world rugby point of view they it was only just after their first world cup they'd had or their second world cup so it was all really new and what happened was we had we had that committee meeting and afterwards Jill who was um president became president of the Canadian Rugby Union and Jamie who was running women's rugby in Canada or the chair of women's rugby in Canada and I were invited to the 1994 um meeting of world rugby where the game was formally recognized and and that was that was just it they were like Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> for those listening in we're just doing a little girly woohoo high five uh here because that is just so exciting that's when you pinch yourself and go what are we doing we're actually at this world you know this meeting of going it's all going to happen uh so exciting so super exciting but also suddenly so challenging right because you've also then got women who have got you know pregnancies on and off you've got their families you've got gender gender biases of of, of time that women can therefore socially be sort of committing to their sport and their um and the time time that they're spending on you know hobbies if you like uh you've also got a massive um pay disparity of you know well, who's going to fund these these women to actually be you know getting to an elite level of of sport and all the all the trimmings that come with that of being even to be able to get to these events you know airfare airfares accommodation what were the biggest challenges that you and your committee found at that stage that's just me imagining you know oh my gosh like it's super exciting and then you go mm, how are we going to do this how then when you have an opportunity how do you back it up um, so there's there's different things. So there's a national level and there's an international level. At a national level, I think that um, our challenges were you're women and you want to play rugby. And there was just the, but why? Why do women want to play rugby? So there was that barrier to overcome. There, there was a lot of reservations about that. And you hear some of the stories about um, clubs who were had certain conditions about the women joining and setting up their clubs. Um, so so we had a lot of that in the 80s and 90s. You know, I remember going to a meeting and some man saying to me on the sideline, well, why would ro you want to play rugby? I said, well, for the same reason that the men want to play rugby. You want a competitive team sport that is a contact sport that you train together, that you play together, that you win or you lose together. What's the difference? And and, and to me, that didn't, I didn't see that that was – I didn't really <laughs> – 
who didn't compute, but he's thinking, why would those lovely girls want to get bruises? Why would they want to do this when there's so many other gentle things that they could be doing? It's just a social change and it's, a, it's a, you know, yeah. it's reinforced by the era that they're in as well. So there's not necessarily judgment on that. Everyone thought that way. And so you're really breaking through. You're pushing barriers. You're, you're changing a community's perspective on actually what is socially even appropriate. For women we were but if you if you look about it and I was reading um, a book that's been written recently about the 1991 World Cup women were playing rugby in the eight in the 1800s and the early 1900s it just all went very quiet for a very long period of time and yes it we did that was one of the challenges was men or people in general didn't couldn't understand why you wanted to play rugby and I think the other challenge was um, funding you know, the women's game in, in Great Britain and, and then in England was seriously underfunded and everything was done on a shoestring. Um, people put vast amounts of their own time and their resources behind them to make things happen. You know, I moved jobs um, before I, I moved jobs in 90, uh, let me just think, about 91 1991 and one of my conditions was um could I have a fully expensed car because actually I was doing so much driving around the country for rugby um I needed to be able to, you know I wanted some support on that and I don't think my company really realized that I also said to them would you mind very much if um I use the phone sometimes for rugby related queries what they didn't know was that my <laughs> phone number there's a lot of queries. <laughs> a lot of queries. Um, they didn't know that actually my number, my work number was the only number for the whole of the WRFU for a period of time. So anybody who wanted to contact you during the day, phone my work number. And my lovely secretary picked up all those calls and dealt with them, you know. Uh. I absolutely love that. That is so funny. Oh, your poor boss. As a boss, I'd be like, oh, I should know that. But hey, they didn't ask and you didn't tell. <laughs> I didn't tell them. And that's, what it, that's what it's part of. You know what? They're actually a part of that journey as well now. So they should be thankful. <laughs> <laughs> now, you touched on sponsorship. That is huge. That is absolutely huge because this is a whole area then suddenly becomes it's a real it's a real skill and expertise to actually be able to, you know, pitch for sponsorship. It's another skill to be able to, you know, close that sale, that deal, that opportunity for people to sponsor. There's the value add, there's the image, there's the brand, there's so many things. So it's during this journey, and I love the way, you know, the real honest truth is this has taken a, you know, 20-year plus journey of yeah. evolution. It doesn't happen overnight. This is people like yourself, like all of those other ladies and um, who I know that you would love to celebrate all of their achievements as well, uh, that collectively you just keep showing up, showing up, showing up and and um, and building what, what then becomes, you know, a, you know, a very, very highly professional organisation. But they all came from these grassroots in someone's someone's bedroom, someone's house, have over coffee um, and using yeah. the world's benefits. So how did you go about that? How did you actually get about go about funding so that you would then start to be able to be the professional outfit that you wanted to be? Um, I think that we were very lucky that some of the women that were playing were their roles was to get sponsorship. That's what they did in their full-time professional roles. So they used that. We spoke to our um, our employers. A lot of employers funded um, and gave us grants. We worked very hard with Sport England, with Sport England trying to fund us. Um, and then gradually, you know, the RFU came on board. The women's game became part of the RFU in England. And that meant there was more funding. And that's where a lot of the funding comes from now. That's why you see the professional players, the current Red Roses. A lot of them have full-time contracts because the RFU are funding that. Um, but there are lots of nations all over the world that are still not at that stage. Um, they're, 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 they've not got professional players. They were playing at a World Cup and they weren't professional players. Um, they'd come from their countries. They would probably paid their flights themselves or contributed to the flights themselves, you know, and, and they've worked full time and they've put their training around their full time jobs and their families so that they can play. And, and that's just where the game is. Um, and that's 
I, I think that's just where we are. And we're very lucky in England that we're so well funded. Yeah. And I think that happens in, in all sports. I know, you know, even in, um, you know, when I was growing up and my fa my father used to, you know, watch rugby league, you, you know, people were doctors or accountants and they actually do, were just fit. And then they still played, you know, elite um, league at that stage to, to, you know, until the profession actually became, you know, professionals, uh, that they actually had had payment to be able to not have to go to the day job, that their, their job was to actually be be so fit and and um, and you know ready match ready uh, to be able to um, be able to you know hopefully ideally win over your competitors and um, but that's a huge huge leap so first of all congratulations to for you be able to um, help be able to pioneer that and also you know appreciation and respect for those people who are still at stages in this game who are you know doing their day job doing everything really and then still just showing up and 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 you know doing that because family friends their communities support them um, and um, and that's just the, the way it is and that's how we sort of evolve different sort of professions so what have been the biggest changes that you've seen in women's rugby over the last, you know, five years or so as it's really started to emerge as a, you know, a, a big global, um, you know, sport? So if I say when I was at the final of the World Cup in Auckland, I just stood there with tears in my eyes before the game even started. And that was because there were 42,000 people watching the game live. And, and going back to 91, in, in Wales, where maybe we had 2,000 at that final, that is a huge thing. The fact that I knew the coverage was on ITV and it had been live. Every game had been live. Um, we'd got players there that were professional. Um, and I think that's the change we've seen in the last five years. We've seen the increase in media coverage, which has been huge and that's partly because there's so much more media coverage of the women's sport generally um we've seen a huge increase in funding and and i think the players generally are so much fitter and so much more athletic than they've been before and that's partly because of um the skill set of the support team they've got around them but it's also the fact that they've got the funding but it was almost overwhelming standing there in Auckland at Eden Park, um, seeing all those people there and to then have been in a, in New Zealand and, and you turn up in some village and they say, oh, why are you over here? And you say, well, actually, I've come to watch the World Cup. They go, oh, yes, it's been great, hasn't it? We've watched the games. We're going to go with a friend to watch it on the TV because we couldn't get tickets because there's been such an increase of attention about it. And, and then when I came home, um, People that I would never have expected to watch the game have been watching the game. And that in itself has been the change that it's so much more accessible to the general pop public. And so many more people are just watching it. Um, and it is just so exciting. Um, I remember when we had the first world, when we had the first Olympics, when the Sevens was played in the Women's Olympics in the Olympics, the women's sevens. I remember being in England watching it in Rio and it was the first sevens. It was like, oh my goodness, we're at the Olympics. Women's rugby is at the Olympics. And I was in, so the games were going on in Rio. I was in England. I was messaging Jill in Canada and Jamie in America, who were the two women that had been on this journey with World Rugby with me. And the three of us were messaging each other and we were doing it live. We weren't having to scrabble around to find those games being things. It was like, look, is that, did you see that try? Wasn't that amazing? And you just think that's the change that we've seen. The yeah. fact that it's so much more accessible. You don't have to wait until two weeks later when World Rugby magazine comes out that they've got a quarter of a page about it. Yeah, exactly. You're in the moment. To be able to be sitting there, oh, I can just picture you in that field in Auckland, by the way, with you and your friends going, oh, my gosh, this is just, it's surreal. It's its so exciting. These The athletes must just look like superhumans because of that funding, because, because of, you know, the support that they have. It's not just having the best coaches. It's the nutritionists. It's the exercise physiologists. It's the psychologists. It's the whole package that actually helps these athletes 
become elite athletes and it must just be like wow uh, amazing 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 and just so triumphant seeing them you know show up into their best form and also just being part of of that whole um moment um a moment in history i think it's just so exciting uh but also uh for for those for those women now coming through to actually go, if you're that girl, if you're Rosie now at 19 playing, you know, rugby at, at university or even, you know, at, in at, in your childhood, they now get an image. They get a visual of, I watch rugby on the telly. I, I have seen them at the World Cup. I see that you can be this professional athlete. I see that, you know, you can be supported in your, in you know, in your sport. Uh, that's that's a massive breakthrough for 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 women's sport because b before then you didn't have that visual you know if you were playing at 19 you didn't actually see that no. you would you would you could be an elite athlete you could make this your profession uh, so I just, you know, congratulate everybody involved. And I know there are many, many other sports who are still emerging in this way. And and my and the message of this conversation today is actually just just stick with it, right? Do you do you now sort of, you know, if you had someone else in a different sport who hasn't sort of done this progression yet, do you sort of what would you say to them if you met them in the cafe? Would you go, never stop, keep going? Yeah, I'd say never stop, keep going. It'll be worth it in the end. And I think also there's just this amazing cross fertilization of information between um, sports. So you see in the men's game, I don't know, a football manager goes to watch a rugby game. Well, I know that um, the Lionesses coach for, for England women, she was watching the Women's Rugby World Cup in New Zealand because she wanted to learn about that. And that's the bit that you say, this is this is mm. wonderful because there's this huge cross pollination of ideas, of concepts. We've got women that have played rugby who are now involved in hockey or they've been involved in boxing or they're coaching football. So they're, they're moving out and, and, and coming into the women's rugby as well. So it's not just one way. Um, and there's all these development programs at world rugby level now to develop the referees, to develop the coaches, as well as the players. And that and those are the step changes. But that all comes back to funding, um, you know. And so, like I said before, England is a very affluent society in terms of sport generally. You know, we put a lot more money in and that's probably why we do so well. Um and there are lots of other nations that have, have got to catch up with that. Um, will they? Yes, they probably will. How long will it take? I don't know. I mean, we could look at the men's game in any sport in the men's game, can't you? In any sport. And you can say, you know, there are nations that are so much further ahead than other nations. Um, but no, it's from a, a women's rugby point of view, it's exciting. The World Cup in 2025 is coming to England. So that is even more exciting oh my goodness you're like bring on 2025 oh my goodness forget the rest oh yeah. that is super exciting you're gonna go crazy <laughs> i mean it, it's just it's just great and i think at the world cup um there was a world rugby meeting there during the women's world cup which is a first as far as i'm aware there was a coaching conference going on that there was then a women in sport conference afterwards so it was bringing all these different people together around an event and and that's those are the sort of changes you we would have never expected that in 91 you know we just wouldn't have expected that in 91 um why would you why would you? And I, and I love that, that, that some people, you know, and I, I, as a business coach, I get that. They go, but I don't know what the dream fully looks like. And you go, you don't need to, that you don't need to. You just need to be leaning into towards what is possible, right? The possibility, the infinite possibility to, to be able to thinking, okay, if we really feed this and nurture it and get all the right people on board, where can it go? You know, and so sometimes that dream is there. And sometimes it's like, oh my God, I couldn't have even dreamt it at that stage. It was just too unrealistic. But 
and you've shown in this in this sport that you know as you every time you got to a new sort of summit you then go oh there's another opportunity there's another opportunity and we can just keep chipping away and that's actually you know a great message for this podcast today on success this is what success takes it actually means that you just keep showing up you you know you put your best foot forward you also I've heard a lot in your conversation is about the collective it's about you know people in different countries all helping each other and turning up and and being able to do their bit and and that is just so powerful you know and that's what it actually does take that's when you get so much uh yeah that's where you get the synergy you know that the value is so much more than you know each individual part together you have certainly achieved more and that must make you just so proud it is and and we talk you know we talk about the elite players because they have the visibility and they're seen because they're the competitors that are on the field we then talk about the administrators like me at the national level for for example but actually what we forget about is all those people who go out turn out week after week coaching their their girls teams in the pouring rain and there's when there's only six of them there when you yeah. want you need 15 for them to play or you have I don't know, somebody who does the washing of the shirts. I remember I used to take our rugby shirts home as a captain and I used to put them through my washing machine because there wasn't another way of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's where you realise that, I guess it's like all sports, that it really is a pyramid, isn't it? Because yeah. it, it, and it has taken every single one of those people along the way doing their little tiny bit to get us to where the game is now um yes and would and would we have known of course we wouldn't have known um and and did we think it would ever get there i don't think we ever did i don't think we i don't think as maybe some of our committee members did but i think looking back in the 80s did we have a vision as to where we wanted the sport to be um no, I think we just wanted more people to play and, and to be accepted uh, and to have a structure that allowed these women to play. And as it progressed, we said, OK, so we've got a league structure. So now we need a competitive structure, which means we have to be able to select an England team or a Welsh team. So we'll set up various organisations, county bodies or constituent bodies. Um, so that they can do the selection process. And then, you know, well, when Jill, Jamie and I went to the World Rugby, that was very much, those early meetings were very much about talking about the next World Cups. Yeah. Um, it wasn't so much about the development of the game. That came at a later stage um, when, I, when I'd stood down at that point. But it was just those little steps that, that we would do. And you'd say, well, this is the next thing. So let's just do it and, and and i think also it's a don't take no for an answer if we'd taken no for an answer there wouldn't have been a 1991 world cup if debs griffin and her committee had said well the rfu hasn't sanctioned it so we're not going to do it it wouldn't have gone ahead so we just did it and it was like we put in place leagues um if we'd said we've got no funding for it so we won't do it we would have never had competitive leagues in the women's game you know and all those women that used to play at international level they all paid they paid their flights they paid for their kit they would sew their emblems onto their kit on the days before matches you know because nobody said no they just said yes this is what i want to do Oh, my goodness. I hope everyone is writing that down. Write down the word just tenacity, just, you know, resilience. It's all these things are going, you know, come on. You know, if someone knocks you down, just keep coming back. You just go come back in a different way, come back in your own way. This is a classic example of if there's no door to open, you just create your own door. You know, you actually just go, okay, well, what is necessary for us to reach this next step? And if it is our create our own sponsorship, sew our own badges on, do it. It's, it's like we will show up despite, you know, and we'll do absolutely everything we can and we'll show them that we are worth it. They didn't know your value then. They didn't know your worth. And so sometimes you actually have to prove that worth and then suddenly people go, oh, we should be supporting this, you know, and there's there's many ways. And I just love the tenacity of the, of you pioneering women that you've actually gone, you know what, we're just going to keep, keep coming anyway, keep coming and just breaking down those barriers. So now you're 
brave enough. You didn't have the big vision at the beginning, but now you do. You've got this amazing World Cup coming to your own home country in 2025. But do you even dream to dare more? Uh, dream more now. What what do you boldly go? I hope this would be super exciting in my lifetime. So, what do I think? So it's I I I mean it's a whole group of other women that are doing the work now so I can just turn up at the World Cup and enjoy it what do I hope I hope that um that's a really really difficult question I hope I hope that we fill Twickenham I think I hope we get 82,000 spectators there um I hope that the funding becomes available for the women across the world to allow them to be the best that they can be um that that so Fiji, for example, or Samoa or some of the smaller nations, you know, I hope that that funding becomes available and that they have the opportunity to develop to be the best they can be. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing that I hope, which we've seen a real change from, we've seen a change of the commentary on the media. You know, this World Cup, very much the, world, the commentary was what fantastic games of rugby this is just superb rugby. One, one commentator said about the World Cup final, which England did lose against New Zealand in the most outstanding match. Um, the commentator said it was probably the best game of rugby he's ever watched. And that in itself is what we want as a game. Um, I think that women just want to be accepted for the fact of how fantastic they play and, and what what a good game they give. Um the final was, for me, devastating. Um, I was sat next to a, a Kiwi couple um, whose daughter had come over to um, England last year in the November internationals and when New Zealand had been beeped and very convincingly by England and she'd got injured, their daughter, but they'd still sat there at the World Cup and we were talking about the game and we talked about the game the whole way through and the elation from the New Zealanders when they won, there was obviously a real minority of English people there, but the elation from the New Zealanders was phenomenal. But from a games point of view, from a world rugby point of view, that World Cup really said the women's game is here. It's got something to offer everyone who want, who's interested in rugby and people who aren't interested in rugby. And I guess that's just what I want. I just want people to be able to see the game and enjoy it for, for what it is. Oh, I love that. And what a great way to finish up. You started with dreaming of 2,000 people at your game. Then you've now seen 40,000 people at your grand game. And now you're like, hey, wouldn't it be great if 82,000 people filled this stadium? It's just like, yes, yes, yes. That is massive actually in what feels like forever for you but actually is a short now we're, we're going exponential and I love what you said there that you actually just want these women to be at their best you know when you know that you could have done better if you had a certain elements of the support framework and we know that it takes a massive team to to be able to make that happen in, in elite sport when you know that those women can actually just show up and just give it their best and that they'd be just proud. Even if they don't win on the day, they go, you know what, that was our best effort and, and we're proud of ourselves and, and, and what we've achieved here. Uh, that, that's, that's just what makes your heart sing, right? It's just, you know, that's what it's, it's worth it. And, um, and I think it's onward and upward. And, um, and I, I love the way you've also, um, throughout this conversation, sort of said, this is not just rugby, this is all women's sport, you know, and we're all learning off each other, where um, there's definitely lots of, you know, checking each other out, what's worked for each other and what's not, because that's how we have, that's how we actually rise together. We actually support each other, uh, that we're not we're not competing against each other you know and sometimes you kind of go well there's a certain amount of sponsorship dollar and it feels competitive but when you actually rise above that and go you know what the, you, you just need to show your value and show what what people could um why you're worth investing in uh, and leave that sort of competitiveness amongst each other out of the equation, you get so much value because all of these, all of these women and men working behind the scenes in all of these, uh, these um, 
professional sport um, areas are all wanting the same thing. They just want to be the best of their best, you know, at, yeah. and and um, just to see out their dream that you just go, oh, my goodness, in my lifetime I want to see this happen. And um, I think you should be super, super proud of all that you, you have achieved. And um, and I'd love you to pass that on to all of those other amazing ladies and that you would love to love to be talking about, I know, as well today um, because I know that's what, that's the sort of lady that you are that you're like I'm just I'm just one of one of many but what you have achieved is truly phenomenal so well done you thank you thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of memoirs of successful women I'm Annie Gibbons founder and CEO of Women's Biz Global and if you would like to fast track your future success hop on over to womensbizglobal.com find out about all things women's biz and most importantly take the opportunity to have a free trial of women's biz tribe i look forward to seeing you online very soon until next episode